All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Bitcoin Brief with your host, Tone Vase, joined by our uh, consistent usual suspects of Jim Song and Lex, the Bitcoin mechanic. Uh, Jimmy, you got a beautiful background behind you. Uh, where are you at? I am in Vail, Colorado, because I'm on vacation and you made me come out and, uh, you know, set this up. I did bring my nice equipment, so I have a mic and everything else. But yeah, I'm in Vail, Colorado. It's like 60 degrees. It's, uh, it's, it's really nice. Have they heard of COVID over there? I think they have, but you know, oh, it's not too oh, bad. <laughs> <laughs> That's unfortunate. All right. I love being in places where they don't know it exists. You can actually live like a, like a normal human. Uh, mechanic, how are you doing today, man? Yeah, good, man. It's a heat wave here on West Coast Canada. Uh, I think it might finally be over today. It hit just under 50 degrees C or 121 F. Uh, not far from me, uh, just on the other side of the, the spit. I'm on the island off the west coast of Canada. And on the other side, back on the mainland, it hit 50 degrees C. Uh, and it smashed records. Uh, that was four degrees hotter than the previous ever hottest temperature, I think. It's been yeah, and, and on days like this, all of the crazy climate change people just come out in droves and how all the icebergs are going to melt tomorrow. Uh, different podcast, though, one of these days where we'll cover all that. I do want to cover that, man. Uh, that but not, I do want to talk about that someday, but not yeah. necessarily on the Bitcoin news show. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I know. I started tweeting a little bit about that, but I don't know. We'll see. After the whole COVID is over, I'm sure uh, the, 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 the next round of uh, if you're a scientist and you don't agree with us, we're going to cancel you. It's going to be the climate change thing. It's already started a few years ago. Anyway, uh, let's move on to the Bitcoin side of the equation. We've got a lot going on, so we're going to go straight to screen share uh we're gonna it's been uh over a week since we've done a show so there have been lots and lots of developments uh not too many shitcoin stories today but one of them is of course about the safe dollar stable coin which <laughs> drops to zero uh after only a quarter million dollars was uh you know exploited out of yet another DeFi insanity um I did not even know stable dollar existed. I've never heard of this thing. Uh, there are more shit coins out there than normal people can actually keep track of. Now, stable coins in themselves are not <coughs> technically shit coins, but when they can be exploited through other shit coins and uh, decentralized platforms, they are. In fact, shit points. Um, any general thoughts on this other than uh, people have to be like, you have to know that this is going to happen. Like the probability of it not happening is smaller than it happens. Like I don't put any money in USDC, USDT or anything like that because I consider them generally unsafe from a technological point of view and from a regulatory point of view even though some of them are regulated by the U.S. government, but then there is confiscation risk. Like there's really no getting around and these things are generally not that great. Uh, Jimmy, let's go with you on this one. Yeah, so th this is an algorithmic stable coin and those are a little different than USDC or USDT. Um, USDC and USDT are backed by somebody and they have an actual bank account with actual dollars that are backing it. This one is an algorithmic stable coin, meaning that they keep, keep the peg to the dollar with some uh, supply of dollars and some supply of the stable coin, which they can print out of thin air. And they have some mechanism for keeping it around the dollar. Obviously that peg failed and it went to zero, probably because somebody figured out a way to um, create lots of the stable coin without uh, the, you know, the owners knowing about it, or maybe it was a rug pull or something like that. Uh, but, you know, like you said, there, there's a uh, risk either way. If it's a custodied uh, stable coin like USDC or USDT, uh, then you always have the possibility that uh, government can seize the bank account and, you know, take the money away. If it's an algorithmic stable coin, well, you also have risk because they have to keep the peg to the dollar and if the peg ever breaks because they run out of reserves or they run uh, or, you know, the stable coin can get printed to infinity, 
um, then, then you lose out as well. So, I mean, like, you're going to have U.S. dollars. Um, the safest uh, U.S. dollar is cash. And unfortunately, that still has risk because it has inflation risk from the U.S. government. Um, these are more risky than the, than straight up cash. So I, I, I don't think I, I don't understand why people get excited about this. stuff. Yeah, I think it's um, the centralization risk is really, really severe with these. Um, I do. I do have one nice thing to say about them in that they're not touted as investments that uh, like a lot of shit coins are because obviously they're not designed to go up in value. They're designed to stay equivalent to $1. So fair enough. Uh, and they do provide, um, you know, uh, the functionality or some of the functionality of, of the better fiat currencies, i.e. the U S dollar to people that wouldn't normally have any way of accessing them, uh, outside of cash. So, uh, I do get why some platforms, uh, list them and, and host them, but, uh, then again, no one wants to hold them. So the, the interest platforms like BlockFi and Ledin offer really high interest rates on the stable coins, which makes people actually use them as potentially an investment or, and, you know, and sort of become blind to the risks and the risks are pretty extreme. This is a real weak one though. This is, it didn't even get to a million dollars, which in the crypto world is this thing was uh, dead before it even started by the look of it. It only made it to a quarter million. Um, it kind of reminds me of that Rick and Morty thing where, you know, the guy runs in to the ship and goes like, Captain, our centralized currency has gone from being worth one of itself to zero of itself. And, you know, <laughs> I like the way they got the word centralized in there. It tells me that the guy that makes Rick and Morty somehow understands what gives Bitcoin its value versus everything else in the space. <laughs> yeah, I never really got into that show, but I know everybody loved it. Uh, yeah, so... Uh, you're right. Most projects in the crypto space start out in the millions of dollars, some in the billions of dollars. And that just shows the ridiculous nature of a lot of this stuff. Well, a little bit uh, closer to the Bitcoin side of the spectrum, a South African exchange or the brothers that ran the South African exchange decided to just run away with $3.6 billion in Bitcoin. I was really surprised by this number. I was surprised how much... Uh, Bitcoin that this exchange had. Um, as far as I know, they still haven't found these guys. And uh, again, more inherent risks when you put your Bitcoin on an exchange. Uh, everything has pros and cons. When you put your Bitcoin on a regulated exchange and regulated exchange, you probably want to go with a regulated exchange in the US or Europe. Uh, you This risk still exists. Uh, the, you know, it's still possible, technically speaking, though less likely, for Brian Armstrong to run away with the Bitcoin. This is the part of Bitcoin that people still don't understand. Uh, a lot of the people in the traditional space, people in the crypto space understand it, is that Bitcoin is a bearer asset. And whoever has the keys to that Bitcoin can always run away with it, whether it's a regulated exchange or an unregulated exchange. Now, the risk of it happening on a regulated exchange is obviously a little bit smaller than the unregulated exchange. Uh, so you should also inquire how the exchange is keeping the Bitcoin safe for their users. But if they talk too much about how, how they're keeping the Bitcoin safe, that creates potential other risk from both hackers and the $5 wrench attack, right? If they say, oh, this guy has you know, two of the three keys, uh, so there are um, lots of issues. So the best thing for you to do is unless you uh, are actually utilizing the Bitcoin and the services of the exchange is not to keep your Bitcoin on the exchange. Uh, anything you want to add to that mechanic? Uh, yeah. Um, having Bitcoin on an exchange, um, if you're interested in Bitcoin and I meet you somewhere and you're like, yeah, I own some Bitcoin. Uh, my immediate question is, is it on an exchange or are we self-custody? And we're kind of slacking on, as a community, someone was shaming us on Twitter yesterday for like, hey, what's happening with the not your keys, not your coins? Why aren't we shouting this loud like we used to? And it needs to be said. Um, I always say it's like buying a private jet and just taxiing it around the runway. And you're like, look at my jet. I'm like, yeah, you know that thing's supposed to fly, right? Until Bitcoin is under your custody, you're walking away from the main benefit of it, which is it's unconfiscatable. And if you're just leaving it with centralized third parties, 
you're not getting the main benefit of Bitcoin. You're getting exposure to its price, but you're not getting actual ownership of it. And that's the, you can't own anything like you can own a Bitcoin. So if you don't actually take it into your possession, you're missing the point. I really think you are. Jimmy? Yeah, I, I'm actually really shocked at how much uh, the amount is here. Mm. Uh, 3.6 billion is a lot of money. But I mean, they, this just goes to show, you know, how much money is just sort of floating around. Uh, and we're really, really early. If uh, even uh, in South Africa, there's like $3.6 billion that, that's going into it. And, uh, you know, they're, they're, they just sort of like uh, left with it. Um, you know, it, it, it's always like sort of this weird game theory. I, I, I do think like sort of the these situations where the founders run away with Bitcoin, it's not going to happen quite as much. The bigger risk for me in having coins on an exchange is the government being able to confiscate it away. And I think that uh, going yeah, forward will be I a bigger risk. And uh, yeah. there have been some, you know, unregulated exchanges that when they got shut down, the creators of those exchanges act actually, you know, found a way to let people still withdraw that money. Uh, so at that point, um, if the government is shutting down a regulated exchange, uh, they could confiscate all that Bitcoin and it could take you years to get it back to the court system. When it's an unregulated exchange getting shut down by the government, um, it's up to the creators of that exchange as to how ethical they are because they have the option to run away or they have, or they can give it back to you. Uh, one specific case of that was one broker. And when they got shut down by the US government, they actually you know, made a mirror site for the sole purpose of returning you your Bitcoin back because uh, the creators were like, the guys managing it were pretty epic. Well, kudos to them for doing that. Yeah. Um, well, right. I mean, yeah, at the ahead. same time, if they didn't return it, they they'd be in danger the rest of their lives from pissed off customers. So Yeah, but, yeah. but Mark Carpellis is still alive and well, and I'm never going <laughs> to understand why. <laughs> well, uh, I think Mark Carpellis, I, I don't think he's, because he didn't profit. He didn't steal anything, right? It was Jet um, that sold them like, uh, you know, an exchange that was insolvent. So Right, so when, uh, when uh, the, the story on the Mount Gox thing, like I actually don't blame Mark Carpellis. I mean, yeah, he I have. do. I, he, his security was horrible. So oh, his security, that, that's was, horrible. His security and, was horrible. And right. when the hack happened, he said it was Bitcoin's fault that he, the, the the hack happened, yeah. which was a weird thing. You're going to take it fun to deal with. Yeah, there were multiple hacks. He kind of covered it up, but uh, but he, it's not. Like, but there's a difference between being incompetent and uh, let's say lying about a hack than actually stealing the money. I, I know it could be semantics. You know, a bad person is a bad person. Uh, but uh, I put. Uh, I, well, I, I, I think he was the, both malicious and incompetent. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, but <laughs> regardless. <laughs> but but I can't believe Jeb McCaleb is not in prison because he sold him Mount Gox with eighty thousand missing Bitcoin, and this is mm -hmm. and and Jeb admits it in email that he sold him Mount Gox with eighty thousand missing Bitcoin, and then a few months later, Mount Gox mysteriously gets hacked for another quarter million Bitcoin. Unreal. Yeah, yeah, it's unreal. Like, like there, there's lots of shit in that case, and uh, uh, that most people never really looked into. Anyway, yeah, I mean, all the stolen coins ended up on BTCE, right? Right, uh, which itself had a <laughs> interesting. That was a that felt like the whole time I, that exchange existed, it felt like a honeypot, or <laughs> just like <laughs> something was very dodgy about that exchange. Oh, um, people are saying that the brothers did surface and the amount is far less. The amount being far less makes total sense. I mean, this number seems very unbelievable. Uh, we need to follow up with the story next time. If the brothers surface, uh, let's see what happens. Uh, but th thank you, live chat, for uh, correcting us. All right, uh, moving on. We have not yet discussed on this show yeah. the alleged suicide uh, of John McAfee in a Spanish prison days before his extradition uh, to the U.S. And uh, the, here is the interesting part. So about um, a year, well, less, uh, yeah, actually a little while ago, about two years ago, 
year and a half ago, John McAfee made it very, very clear that he would not commit suicide and that if he dies of suicide, that someone caused that suicide. Uh, so that was really interesting. In addition, uh, right after his death, there was a building collapse in Miami and rumors started to circle that John McAfee had a uh, connection to that building and that is where he was hiding the secret documents that supposedly he was going to release that would uh, you know, take down the U.S. government like you know, the Assange situation with WikiLeaks. Uh, there have been multiple articles saying that there really is no link between McAfee and that building. And this is all just conspiracy. Like, honestly, I don't trust news anymore. So I, it, it's very difficult to now uh, see the difference between like conspiracy and actual investigative journalism, because I don't believe that investigative journalism takes place anymore. And uh, like journalism has become really, really bad. So I don't really know what to think anymore. I'm leaning towards the fact that McAfee was more uh, crazy. Uh, and then, uh, well, like, I don't believe he had connections to that building. That's my opinion. Uh, we all know that McAfee was constantly pushing scams. And while it's unfortunate that the U.S. government arrested him, uh, he was certainly in violation of security laws and security fraud as he was charging to promote outright scams. Now, we can debate whether the SEC should exist or whether these security laws should exist, uh, but McAfee was certainly breaking those laws. Um, I'm not gonna get into the whole tax situation that's uh, to each their own there. And um, yeah, my only interaction with McAfee, oh, I mean, I've had several interactions with McAfee, uh, but there was one that uh, was actually recorded and that was when I was hanging out with Nick Kaur uh, down in Miami. We were at a conference. Is this thing going to pull it up? Why is my internet so slow? And McAfee came over. No chauffeur here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. People from Italy and everybody in the building. Right. So people always watch. I can't really make out a word, dude. It was basically schooling us on the Rolls Royce because we were in the Rolls Royce. Uh, anyway, hey, guys, your thoughts on uh, John McAfee. Was he good for the space? Was he not good for the space? Uh, I don't know. It's uh, This is a tough one. It really, really is. Yeah, I, I think if you don't love John McAfee, something there's a part of you that's not there that should be this there's, there's something about that kind of character that needs to be celebrated uh it's it's almost like trump as well like um as as bad uh, as you like might find him there's something about them that goes look like fair enough you know if you if you stand up to a, just a tidal wave of shit that is coming at you u.s government you know or well, like Trump did, he had the he had the CIA hated him. The entire American media hated him. Just I'm gonna respect anyone that has to deal with that, regardless of anything else that they have. And I think it's just hard to do. And uh, uh, and just join. I think it's cowardly to join in with the whole hate. You know, even though Trump did awful stuff and John McAfee did awful stuff, I'm just gonna say like fair enough to those people. You know, it, they're the actual underdogs. Believe it, uh, believe it or not, whether whether they make it as high up as they did. Um, when it comes to the conspiracy theories, I think it's fair enough to just say, Tone, like, I don't know. Like, I don't think any of us know. It's super possible that someone is like, I'm going to be killed, I'm going to be killed, I'm going to be killed. They tattoo it on their arm, and then they kill themselves. That right. can, it, would be, that it, would be, it would be the ultimate troll by John McCann yeah. to do that, and he is the kind of person that would uh, consider doing that, just like the ultimate uh, <laughs> troll based on his prior tweet yeah like i i can see him doing it as a troll uh, i can also see him being you know everyone knows epstein didn't kill himself everyone knows that if you if you genuinely are pretending that epstein killed himself you're being just you're just dishonest or cowardly or something that's annoying um that's annoying to deal with but mcafee it's not so clear-cut he might have done but i i'm definitely open-minded that he was killed uh but i don't want to pretend i know because uh, I don't want to lie to myself and pretend I do. There's probably people that have some connections and actually know what happened there. 
but like we'll ever find out. I agree with you, man. Like the, the, the journalistic integrity of our species is just gone. The only good journalist is sitting in Belmarsh prison in the UK. You right. Know? And it's, that's what happens if you're a good journalist. Now you, you get, you get hounded out by all the cowardly journalists that you highlight what cowards they are. And then they go after you like a, a bunch of beta males and, and it's just evil. You just get, uh, you just get pitchforked. So it's I, evil. I, uh, no, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, I, don't, like, I don't really put McCarthy up there with Trump. I mean, Trump was never accused of murder, and, uh, uh, and McCarthy was, and that's a, that was a serious accusation, which made him get out of uh, Belize. Uh, and then there's also uh, an accident where one of like, his nephew got killed, and uh, John was involved. Uh, and I, I know, you know, personally, that he was constantly doing a lot of drugs. Not that I, I mean, I think all drugs should be legal, uh, but still, you know. That doesn't uh, mean you have to take them all. <laughs> right, doesn't mean you have to take all of them. Uh, and um, I, I, I know that he was. Uh, Jimmy, your thoughts on McAfee and what he meant for the space? Yeah, I mean, he's the type of person that just gets involved in, like, way too many things. Um, so, I, who knows, he, he could have gotten whacked by some government person or somebody in prison or all sorts of people, like, it, it could have been a suicide as well. I like there's we really know very little. And like you guys said, there's not much journalism coming out of this thing. So uh, and, you know, what, whatever journalism there is, they clearly have a bias and they want you to believe something. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I'm going to reserve my judgment on him. I don't think he was very good for the space. Um, he, he was clearly a shit coiner and made shitcoins a lot more popular and made sort of trading them very popular. Um, not, not him alone, obviously, but he, he was a sort of a, pro a proponent of that. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I did meet him once and he had like a whole entourage with him. Um, and, you know, he, uh, it was uh, flattering to know that he knew who I was, but you could kind of tell he's kind of crazy. So um, yeah, hard, hard to know what, what's going on when you have a crazy person. Uh, that that died i think it's like the end scene in fear and loathing in las vegas you know where he's like there he goes one of god's own prototypes too weird <laughs> too weird to live too rare to die like just <laughs> 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 uh, all right so speaking of uh yeah. unfortunate deaths uh we have one more in the crypto space uh the drowning of uh marcia of a best school i hope i'm saying the name right uh, I'm not that familiar with his work. It happened mostly before my time in the crypto space. And uh, the mystery surrounding how much Bitcoin he had is a giant range between 100,000 and a million Bitcoin, which I think is a little bit insane. Um, I think it's closer to 100,000 is my guess, because I don't think anyone has <laughs> that many Bitcoin except maybe Satoshi, and that is still a big maybe. Uh, uh, so this one is... Uh, I mean, Jimmy, I'm sure you're probably most familiar uh, with his work in the past. You've been in crypto space the longest out of the three of us. Uh, Pete Rizzo had a nice long uh, Twitter thread about him. Uh, he also wrote an article in Bitcoin Magazine. All of these articles are linked in the uh, video description. You can read more about him on Wikipedia. And uh, he's been very was a very early bitcoiner uh and uh did good for the space also had a nice little uh back and forth with the sec i was reading over some of that email uh discussion as i was glancing over his work uh jimmy any thoughts on uh marcia and like uh what he meant for the space? yeah i mircha is uh is a one of the weirdest characters that i've ever heard of in 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 the space, you, you think McAfee's weird. This this guy's even weirder. Um, he did make quite a bit of Bitcoin though, because he ran something called MPEX, uh, MP being his initials and EX standing for an exchange. And essentially it was like a proto ICO platform uh, where companies could sell shares of, um, uh, of themselves on this exchange. Um, it was famous for not getting hacked because you had to use your PGP key in order to execute trades. So uh, mm. unless you, uh, you, you knew PGP, 
you couldn't do anything on there. Also, he charged 30 Bitcoin just to get on the exchange. You couldn't trade on the exchange unless you paid him 30 Bitcoin. And at that point, you could go in and buy shares of ASIC Miner and many other companies that were on there. Uh, it turned out that he was running a pretty big scam, though. Um, MPEX was known to have uh, issued way more shares of certain companies uh, based on how they were trading. Um, and if um, Mircha didn't want uh, things to go a certain way, he, he wouldn't let it go a certain way. Um, he also had like three women that he had relationships with that were self-proclaimed like slaves of Mircha. Um, and they're the ones that actually confirmed his death, which is very strange. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if he somehow faked his own death to sort of get out of the public eye. Uh, but yeah, he, he had a lot of, he, he's been a weird character for in the space for a long time. Uh, one of the earliest critics of Ethereum, if I remember, um, he offered to um, uh, get on one side of the trade for uh, like uh, Ethereum futures, uh, you know, basically on the downside. Um, unfortunately, I don't think he ever, a anyone took him up on the bet or whatever. Uh, but yeah, he also had that BitBet site, uh, which was, I, I think I played with like once uh, and I think I lost a little bit of money. Uh, but yeah, th th this is the stuff that he was into. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised at all if he faked his own death or did something like that. But yeah, he, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know if I would agree with the characterization that he was like the original uh, Bitcoin maximalist because he did a lot of like scammy uh, things related to, you know, MPEX and things like that, which I totally don't think is was like very maximalist of him. Yeah, I think that's a, calling someone a toxic maximalist. That's just a euphemism that uh, means people that don't uh, want to let you get away with scams. So if you are scamming, then you don't have the kind of integrity that I associate and connotate with actual Bitcoin maximalist. Uh, it just sounds like, a, sounds like a, a bastardization of the term to me. But I don't really have much to add. I didn't, I somehow missed it. I was here since 2011. I missed it. I never heard of this guy until a week ago, which is crazy to me. Uh, but apparently he wrote 70 to 100 blogs a month. So there's no way I'm catching up with that. Um, uh, he seems nuts. He had three slaves, right? What well, I'm reading from Pete Rizzo's thing. Like, yeah, and here is uh, another one where I just clicked on this. I'm not sure where it took me. It took me anywhere. Uh, maybe there are links for yeah, he, he did some crazy stuff. Um, he, he was threatening to basically uh, like stay on an older version of Core and not upgrade and basically leverage that to, uh, I forget if it was SegWit or pay to script hash or something, make it so that it wouldn't activate or uh, you know it wouldn't validate or something like that. Well, he was trying to hold the network hostage or something? Yeah, or something to that effect. I, I vaguely remember something to that effect. I, I, I should really go look it up. Wow. Uh, yeah, I, I got to say, like, I'm really not familiar with him at all. Like, the first time I he, ever He was much more prominent in 2011, 2012, 2013. Um, and yeah, it was before my time. That's why, yeah. like, I, 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 the first time I ever heard his name was, like, now. Yeah, I, it, it was crazy because like uh, I remember talking to Brian Armstrong a long time ago and he, he was uh, he was asking about ICOs and what I thought of them. And I was like, well, you know, M MPEX pretty much did the same thing. He's like, what's MPEX? He's like, how long have you been in the space? And he didn't know what <laughs> MPEX was. Uh, man, uh, did was he on BitcoinTalk.org? Yeah, he, he, he was on Bitcoin Talk, uh, but I think uh, the main place that he hung out was the IRC channel, uh, Bitcoin mm -hmm. Assets. That, that was where he was. Do you remember his uh, Bitcoin Talk username? Probably MP or Mircha. That, that, that would probably be it. God, man, I can't believe I never came across him. Mm -hmm. I used to have a bot that would tell me every time there was like a, a thread gaining traction on Bitcoin Talk. And I didn't have an account yet. But all through 2012, I would just read every thread on there that got over a certain amount of attention. You know, mm. but 
Uh, that that for does anyone use that forum anymore? Just as a quick side. Yeah, and, no, no. That, um, there's a lot of people on there. Uh, I think Maxwell still hangs out there quite a bit. And uh, if you're selling casacious coins or uh, you know anything <laughs> like fine. that, that's the place to go. And uh, there's yeah, a I lot mean, of there's, non-English there's speakers that use it. I think. Well, there, there's a lot of people that use it. Period. Um, mm. Yeah, it's it's not a bad place, and it was the place for a long time before Reddit took over, and then. It became Twitter um, in like 2015, 2016. So. Yeah, that's right. All right, guys. So speaking of um, chip coins and ICOs, Tom Brady and Giselle Bunchen take equity stake in crypto firm FTX. Now, my problem with FTX is the same problem that I have with Binance, and uh, we might cover Binance right after this story, because I don't understand why an exchange needs its own token and ftx is a to is an exchange with its own token and ftx actually has the rights to the uh, arena down in miami where the miami heat play uh it's now the ftx arena and i just don't understand how uh like they're not on the sec's radar again uh i'm not here to defend the sec and uh, jimmy and giacomo always rant on the show how bad the SEC is, but I'm also not a fan of exchanges like Binance and like FTX that have their own shit coin. Uh, so what does it mean when you have celebrities like Tom Brady investing in a Bitcoin exchange or a crypto exchange that has its own shit coin where the creator of the exchange is clearly has not made enough money uh, from the exchange itself, from the shitcoin power in the exchange from the hedge fund that trades in the exchange to where he also went out and created yet another shitcoin called safe moon in order to also try to compete with binance uh but he decided to do it with two shit coins instead of one uh what are your general thoughts on this situation yeah i mean um the thing about a lot of these athletes is that they have a lot of money uh and if you know athletes, they, they tend to start their own venture fund or whatever. The problem is they get, uh, they have trouble getting good deal flow and they have trouble getting access to the really good investments. They uh, uh, usually get pitched by lots of people, but it's, uh, it's not necessarily very good investments. Um, and this really speaks to sort of like the melting ice cube effect of fiat money. Uh, you, you have to constantly invest and, I'm sure uh, Giselle and Tom have lots and lots of money, probably in the hundreds of millions range. And, uh, and they, they wanted to go invest uh, a, a lot of this money. Um, and they got a decent deal. Honestly, FTX is probably at a higher level of uh, deal, deal flow than what a lot of other people get, a lot of other athletes get. Uh, so they probably jumped on it without thinking too much. I do agree that I think uh, FTX is pretty scammy. Uh, but, you know, there, there's a reason why Tom Brady had laser eyes and stuff. It, it's because he's talking his own book. He probably has some Bitcoin investment. But, you know, I mean, he's a he's a rich guy and rich people have to constantly invest. They need to look for deal flow. They need to look for uh, places to park their money. Uh, this, I guess, seemed like a good place as any for them. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, no, I'm sure he got some kind of equity in the company, right? But this is, again, because uh, people in the live chat are saying he didn't buy the token. But I still don't understand the reason for the token, right? If FTX... Well, the reason for the token is so that they can make more money. And that's, well, that's of the Of course, right? But, but this goes back to the Ripple thing, right? Like Ripple has their own token, and yet Ripple wants to go public on the traditional stock exchange, right? So FTX yeah. has its own token... And yet they also have equity that people can buy in the firm, which is also kind of like a digital token that represents the value of the company. So that once again questions, uh, why is there a token? At least in the case of the INX exchange, their token is the security, which I always question the INX token. Uh, that's Barry Silbert's brother, Alan Silbert. But at least they made it clear that it is an equity token. It just makes no sense to be a utility. This is a utility speculative token, and yet there could potentially be equity in the company, which will also be a token on maybe the New York Stock Exchange one day or some other global exchange. 
Like this is the bizarre world that we're living in uh, and people are gonna be buying into the FTX token. Um, go ahead, uh, mechanic. Yeah, the tokens are scams. I mean, the elaborations on stuff you see in, the, in meat space, like the farmer's market down the road uh, where I live, when you want to go into it, you have to buy these like wooden chips, you know, and you can use them to buy stuff instead of actual cash. I, or you can just use cash. Um, I don't like fair enough uh, in that. So there's a, some reason that escapes me that you need to have that. But uh, I don't mind if, an, if a business does that. Like if an exchange says, if you want to come in here, we have our own money that we use. And oh, yeah, we, but that's like a casino model too, right? You go into yeah, a casino, you don't put cash on the table, you buy your <laughs> Exactly. And you can tip the waiters with it and it, it becomes a medium of exchange in there. And fair enough, mediums of exchange are really trivial use of money. Like amusement parks have it as well, right? Like Disney right. bucks. Probably. They're not speculative either. Yeah, they're, they're not speculative. They're not floating. They're more like stable coins, to be honest. But um, when you when you move into this whole, into this next world of let's, let's have it free floating on the market, let's give it a, like a, you know, it's out there, it's Binance token, it's whatever. Like, I get it. I get why it exists. Um, but I just, what I just don't get is why anyone would actually invest in these things, man. That's, that just, it just bothers well, It's a greater me. fool thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, speaking of exchanges with um, shit coins for no reason other than making the creators rich, uh, yeah. Binance has been banned in the UK, but I think everything is becoming banned in the UK. It, 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 ha it hasn't been banned. I think this is uh, FUD. It's it's basically been like, there's been some small uh, technical complaint uh, that they have to comply with. And this headline is just completely making a mountain out of a molehill. I think they're still operating fine. I think they have some time limit to, to comply with something that's just changed a bit. I don't um I don't, I don't know exactly the details of it, but I don't think it's been banned. I'm sorry if I'm not actually reading the whole article yet, but everyone that I've spoken to about it just says, oh, it's over, it's over the top there. Yeah, fine. no, and uh, Europe is uh, also getting out of control. I tweeted this out um, earlier today. I'm just going to pull it up here. And um, some uh, European bureaucrat, I love his title, uh, the director of the Central Planning Bureau uh, called on the cabinet to fully ban Bitcoin. This is in Europe. Uh, this was already shut down by <laughs> uh, the Dutch finance minister saying this is insane. But uh, I just like love this headline. I mean, does it, what's the what's five, the five year? I, I think uh, I am hearing an echo of myself. One of you has your speakers unmuted. Oh, uh, uh, so, I mean, I'm using the same system I always did. That seems weird. All right. Well, yeah, central planning. I mean, I, what, again, what boggles my mind is why anyone thinks these socialistic practices don't end in disaster. Like, yeah, sure, I'll take the title. I'll do the job if I have no morals and I'm the one in charge. But is anyone looking at that and going, oh, cool. I love this Peter Hassekamp guy. I can't wait to have my my life planned by a bureaucrat. I can't right. wait to lose my freedoms. Like, <laughs> um, all right, Jimmy, uh, your general thoughts before we move on to El Salvador. Yeah, I mean, not, not much to really add there. Uh, you know, it's uh, unfortunately like, <laughs> uh, you know, regulators regulating, what, what can I say? All right, we got two stories out of El Salvador. One is the country or the I guess the government bureaucrats are planning to buy $135 million worth of Bitcoin. That should certainly give it a little bit of a price boost, even though this is not a crazy amount of money and MicroStrategies and Tesla own way more. Uh, the more interesting news is their plan to give everyone in that country $30 worth of Bitcoin through their cryptocurrency app. Um, I personally don't think this is the best use. Like a lot of people are like, well, why are they dollar denominating it? Why aren't they giving them, you know, whatever, a million sats or whatever that comes out. So I'm still, I'm still having a problem thinking in sats. Uh, why didn't they denominate it in Bitcoin? Uh, like I personally don't think that giving money away to people is the best use of, you know, 
government's ability. Uh, I feel the same way in the US when they're cutting checks to everyone for $600, then $1,400, whatever. They're printing that money out of thin air. Obviously, the government cannot print Bitcoin out of thin air. Mm -hmm. But I think, uh, I, I think the government could have found a better use than giving this away to the people. But then again, governments tend to squander money away. So if they can't print the money to give it away to the people, I guess it's better that they give Bitcoin away to the people instead of government doing something evil with that money. Uh, what are your thoughts on these developments, Jimmy? Let's go with you first. Yeah, I mean, like I, I agree. Airdrops have like never really worked. Uh, they tried it at MIT. These are some of the most technical people that uh, that that you could think of. Most of them just like sort of cashed it in right away, got their hundred bucks, and then they they were done. Um, I suspect that it'll be very similar. There'll be a huge buy of Bitcoin by the government, they'll hand it out and then they'll just go, you know, spend it, uh, basically. Um, that's what happened with stimmy checks or whatever. I, I don't think it's effective. I don't think it's necessarily good. Yeah, um, I second what both of you guys have said. I love that, um, I really like that, unlike the stimulus checks, this wasn't just pulled out of Joe Biden's ass. Instead, it, they had to actually buy stuff that was actually mined and work went into creating these Bitcoins that are being handed out. That's a little different, you know? That's like giving people food or something rather than, than just comp something considered worthless by the person that's actually handing it to you. I like that. I think it's a... I don't think it's a, like as bad or as pointless as it might look. It might... It might, uh, on the surface, amount to nothing. Like, yes, everyone just goes and spends it. No one treats it with any respect. But it's it's part of a timeline. And in the future, this may be done again. And people are all aware of, oh, they can, you know, that $30 worth of Bitcoin we all got. Um, well, sorry, that amount of Satoshis we got, uh, they just did it again. But we got a quarter of the amount of Satoshis this time. So that's part of a collective learning experience for a whole country and the world really to go, Oh, wow. You know, I don't know how much is $30. What's that? Like, you know, uh, that's like 50,000 sat or something. I don't know. It's hard. I didn't really, I agree with you, Tony. I'm still not there with <laughs> adapted to stats, but you know, if you get a uh, 50,000 sats from their stimulus thing, then next time you only get 12,000, then you're going to look at that and you're going to see it. Uh, one question, guys. Uh, I don't have access to Strike because I'm not Canadian. Sorry, I'm not U.S. or El Salvadorian citizen, so I can't use the app yet. Um, but um, it, on their website, it says it's non-custodial, but then they go off to define non-custodial as the users do not have custody. Uh, Strike does, which is the opposite of how custodial is usually used in the space. Um, can either of you confirm whether it's custodial or not? Um, I like the way most people use it is to use their dollars to go pay somebody in Bitcoin. So it, it's uh, I, like they're, they don't have the dollars until you deposit it with them. So I don't mm. know. yeah, Maybe but I mean, that's can the you, part that they're talking about. If you have, uh, you can deposit Bitcoin on strike, right? Yeah, yeah, and I believe it's uh it's controlled by them. I'm not sure. It, it I, does haven't, sound... I haven't tried that side. Fair enough. It does sound custodial to me, uh, even though they say it's non-custodial, but then define that as custodial. Um, and this, there's been a lot of uh, uh, fud about the fact that the government are giving it to everyone, and there's KYC involved. But of course, there's KYC involved. Like you're not going to just give thirty dollars randomly to everyone because uh, people can just keep claiming the money over and over again, right? So they have to have a system where they're like, uh, we've already given you your $30, we haven't given it to you. So obviously there's going to be KYC here, guys. There's no way for them to to do this without that. And as far as I can tell, I haven't, uh, I haven't confirmed this as much as I'd like, so put a little asterisk next to this, but uh, you can withdraw the Bitcoin the minute you get it from the government app. So you can go straight over to Moon Wallet or Phoenix or something where you are the custodian of your own Bitcoin and the government app isn't going to stop you from doing that. So as far as I can tell, like Jack from Twitter, uh, I know he's a politician uh, uh, and I know Jack is, you know, the, the head of a media platform we all really don't like, but, uh, or a social media platform. But as far as Bitcoin comes, he hasn't set a foot wrong yet. And uh, I respect them until they do. 
All right. Um, and uh, what about the thoughts on the government purchasing a large sum of Bitcoin? See, what I would have rather seen it, I like this. And then I would have loved for the government to announce a certain metric. You know, we just bought 135 million US dollars worth of Bitcoin. When this investment doubles in value, we will then give everyone in the country, you know, $50 worth of Bitcoin. So this way they give away some of that profit and still make money on that deal. So this way the whole country is watching how the government bank is appreciating. Oh. Yeah, possibly in dollars, but yeah, I I don't know if they're going to get that sophisticated just yet. I, I think they this uh, toe in the water. You mean... Uh, I misunderstood you, Tony. You're saying, why didn't they buy, then announce it afterwards, and then... Right, like, like for example, like, why, why don't they... Uh, Bitcoin price is down over 50% since a few months ago. If they're about to buy a lot of Bitcoin, uh, why don't they wait till that Bitcoin goes up in value before uh, giving it away to the people while still making money on their investment? Well, I don't know if I would... Uh, that's... That's more of them tipping their head to like the number go up part of Bitcoin rather than all the other things we love about Bitcoin. So I'm kind of glad they didn't. Like uh, the people that are here for just a greater fiat valuation of Bitcoin, I still haven't really got it in my opinion. But, but for a small Latin American country and uh, the history of Latin America and uh, like the IMF, like basically raping every single country of Latin America, Mm -hmm. Number go up and get rid of the mob boss, uh, which is the IMF and the World Bank, is to me the most important thing. Hmm. I'll have to think about that. I don't know. Uh, I, I think um, there's so many other things that Bitcoin will do for El Salvador. Um, that is a huge one. Of, that is a huge motivating factor for sure. So, but there's something, don't you think there's something a little bit. Uh, distasteful about them saying hey we bought 135 million dollars quietly and the price went up now it's worth 145 million dollars how is that exactly uh well all right fair enough that is oh, a no, no, no they're not buying it quietly obviously no i didn't say that i mean i'm okay oh, actually in fact um i wouldn't be happy if they're buying it quietly uh they if this is uh, public money right it's the money for the people it should be public what they're doing uh -huh. uh, fair enough yeah so but I mean, wouldn't the implication be then that you're still implying that Bitcoin is something you buy to get more fiat in the long run? Uh, well, at the moment, yeah, sure. Uh, because the, they're the only country that is actually treating Bitcoin like a currency. Most of the countries are treating Bitcoin like an investment, not uh -huh, a currency. That's a good point. Including in the United States, which is why they expect you to pay taxes on that coffee uh, if the Bitcoin appreciated, right? So uh, as far as I'm concerned, El Salvador is the only country that's treating Bitcoin like a currency. And until more people respect the currency side of Bitcoin, uh, this is the only uh, way to really think about it. Let's see what Jimmy thinks about this. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 don't, I don't really care. Um, I don't think it's a very good use of public funds. I don't think they should be buying it like that unless they're using it for their reserve um so you know that that's my opinion <laughs> well that, that's my assumption that they are using this for their reserve i thought they were uh giving it out to uh their citizens 30 bucks each but i don't know <laughs> do they have that many citizens let's see a million people would be 30 million so four million yeah i, I think yeah. they, they probably have that yeah yeah see uh okay so i for some reason why do i think these were two independent things I um, see. I would rather the government of El Salvador keep that money as a reserve than hand it out. That's my view. Hmm. Me too. Uh, though I don't think there's uh, I don't think there's no no advantage to them giving it to their citizens. I do think you know even if ten thousand kids manage to I don't know if they're giving it out to every citizen or just adults. But if there's some people that hold on to it and turn that thirty dollars into three grand. Three grand's a lot to an El Salvadorian, and, and that can happen. Well, well, it says there in the article, four four and a half million adult yeah. citizens. Oh, That's Adam. where they got the one hundred thirty five million yeah. from. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't like this use of uh, public money. 
I, I don't like the use of public money. I mean, $30 per person. I know it's El Salvador and $30 buys a lot, potentially more than $1,000 in the U.S. Who knows? Uh, but uh, I've never been to El Salvador. I really need to go. But it would be so much better for the future of that country if uh, they use it as a reserve. Yeah, they should just, they should have maybe done a percentage of what they're doing here like this and then just kept the others, uh, kept some as a reserve. It's a bit silly. How they, they, they shouldn't do anything other than keep it in the reserve. That's the only real use case that they should be focused on so they could have a balanced budget. I'm looking at silver linings. I, I agree with you guys, but um, I know what happens. They'll give this money to people. And as you say, most of them will spend it. Uh, I don't know if you can lose it because it's a KYC wallet. You could probably just recover it. Um, but people usually just lose it when you give them Bitcoin or, you know, and then all those people are going to have to deal with, oh, wow, that $30 I got all the way back in 2021 when, you know, you know, 15 years ago, I could now buy a house with it. Uh, that's a learning experience for millions of people. So um, I'm happy that it's going to happen. And also Bitcoin as a currency is not, you know, very dumb. Is not very useful over there yet. And that's why I'm saying, look, you can put this in reserve, wait for it to double in value, and then give everybody $30, and you still have your original investment in Bitcoin in reserve. <laughs> and, and Lightning would be easier to use in, a, I don't know, about six months to a year when it eventually doubles, because we know it will eventually double. Uh, one thing I wanted to say about El Salvador is I'm so happy it's happening now and not you know, a year or two ago when Lightning is just just about usable now for non-techie people because of wallets like Moon and Phoenix. Um, Barely, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's just ready. Like, it's. I'm not saying it's great or it's easy, but it's actually doable. And can you imagine if everyone had been onboarded, if a country had gone, like in 2016, if a country had gone Bitcoin like this and they'd all gone on main chain and then we'd had to deal with Jihan spam and just expensive transactions you know that deserve to be expensive can you imagine that and everyone would have had to learn a whole new user experience and user interface like i'm so happy that everyone's onboarding to lightning in the first place and while it's like moon sorry to keep mentioning it, I, I promise i'm not sponsored or anything but uh, they they obfuscate the whole thing so you're kind of in lightning the whole time but you're using bitcoin the whole time as well uh, if you just have a bitcoin address you receive some bitcoin it's automatically on it on it's still on chain, but it's also within a lightning channel at the same time. So you can kind of, you know, that makes it so easy for people. And, uh, you know, all these B caches coming out about expensive transactions and the ignorant comments like that just looks stupid now because lightning's just mature enough that we can say, no, there's a whole country that's onboarding straight to lightning. No one's complaining about it. It's not vaporware anymore. It totally, it's usable. It's great. And, you know, we got the proof now. Yeah. No, I agree. All right, guys, our last story is the upcoming difficulty adjustment uh, over to the downside. We are looking at a 20 to 25 percent uh, difficulty adjustment. The biggest one prior to this was all the way back in 2011 of an 18 percent uh, difficulty adjustment. Uh, so we are looking at something historic. And of course, we all know this is caused by all of the miners that have to shut down in China and they are moving to a new home. Of course, the haters of Bitcoin are all over this. We can go straight to the hash rate. Where is, there is uh, the mempool. So we are looking at an upcoming difficulty adjustment of minus 26%. Uh, blocks have been 20 plus minutes on average between them. And yet the mempool is still fairly small. I am actually incredibly happy. Had this situation happened about four or five months ago, it would have been a total disaster. Uh, so uh, your general thoughts, like all oh, that hash rate is going to come back online. People are fighting all over the place how unsecure Bitcoin is now. And it's like, yeah, the hash rate is going to drop down to the 2019 levels. And all that mining equipment will eventually find a new home. So it's all going to come back online. Uh, Jimmy, let's... Uh, but let's get over to you because I know you're on vacation and uh, we should probably let you go soon. <laughs> yeah, so I, it, it's taken like 18 or 19 days for this difficulty adjustment period, which, um, which is the longest that it's ever been. Uh, usually it's like 14 days or shorter, usually like 13 and a half, somewhere around there. 
Um, and there was one day where the average blocks were around 26 minutes apart, something like that, which is, uh, which is a lot of hashing equipment. Um, I suspect that, uh, you know, we'll, we'll probably go down again in the next period, although it really does depend on how quickly the new mining equipment or the transported mining equipment comes online. Uh, but yeah, I mean, like the Bitcoin critics, they don't know what the hell they're talking about. This, this is not, they're, they're trying to make, uh, you know, anything sound like it's bad for Bitcoin. It, it isn't. It's, it's just a normal part of the process. Even if it had happened five or six months ago, fees would have gone up, more miners would have come online and uh, people would have been motivated to move uh, their equipment and get it online faster. That, that, that's uh, how it's supposed to work. It's a self-correcting system. So I don't see any problem with it. I don't see, uh, uh, you know, any disaster or anything else. Right now, it is extremely profitable uh, to mine on Bitcoin. Um, and th uh, this is because a lot of um, minor mining equipment in China is turned off. So, you know, if you, if you have like an S9, it might be very... Uh, it, it might be profitable to go uh, go turn it on um, and so on. So hey, this, this is how the market works. You, you know, like hash rate drops, it's more profitable, more people come online and that's this, that's that's how it's supposed to work. It's it's the system working to perfection, in my opinion. What, when is it supposed to take place? I think in the next 24 hours, right? I believe so. Um, I haven't checked, but what's the block number? It uh, is. The last block was... Six eight nine two three two. Okay, yeah. It's two hundred forty uh, blocks to retarget. That's quite a way away. Yeah. How many? Two hundred and forty. No, oh, no, it's two thousand sixteen. Two thousand. Oh, two hundred forty blocks to left to retarget. Yeah. yeah so that that's going to be about uh, two days at least, probably a little more than that. Yeah, that's one hundred forty-four right. blocks in. Uh, right uh, yeah but but it's uh, slower right now so it's probably gonna be more than uh more okay than, so you know, around 40. july 3rd we're looking yeah. at friday maybe saturday i think all right yeah, the, the today's the 30th so yeah third yeah probably i all i right. agree with every point jimmy just made man absolutely knocked it out of the park like uh, if it happened six months ago then i like what happens i think if you get these sudden massive drops in difficulty, every time we do it, what happens in the subsequent period is uh, you you actually clear the mempool because people stop being stupid with the the transactions. Like you get uh, every, every time there'll be at least one exchange that says, "All right, we have to start batching now, or we need to stop using legacy addresses as deposit addresses," and it just encourages economic use of the blockchain, which. If Bitcoin had started with smaller blocks and they'd made it to one megabyte now, we would have seen be better practices in the, in the long run. But because Bitcoin went for so many years with empty blocks, people like, you know, companies like Coinbase just never showed it any respect. They never treated block space like it was a scarce resource, which is the whole, that is such an integral part of Bitcoin's uh, incentive structure that miners get paid in the long run with transaction fees. You don't, you're not asking people to mine out of the goodness of their heart. Um, you're asking them to mine because you're paying them to do it. So when people say we want uh, you know, cheap transactions, they don't understand that. And uh, people were treating transactions like they deserve to be free, and it was just an annoying thing to have to pay the fees. That's because they don't understand. So like to get back to the point, six months ago, if, if, if we'd have one of these big drops, it would have been great because, again, it just encourages people to use the, the blockchain properly. And uh, everything else Jimmy said is just absolutely spot on there. Absolutely. Yeah, no, we're going to go ahead and finish up. Uh, we will cover this story on our next show. We'll try to get Giacomo on. I uh, just wanted to show the graphic, and it was uh, really, really interesting. Uh, so the beef between Samurai and Wasabi and mm -hmm. all things in privacy. Uh, so this is going back to 2018 where Samurai said, uh, if you ever see alts in Samurai Wallet, uh, we have been compromised. And then here is a recent tweet uh, that they're working on atomic swap functionality with uh, Monero. We actually want to do a nice discussion about Monero uh, with the guys here and whether it is or isn't a shit point. Giacomo just texted me uh, with the following tweet where Samurai is going to double down on privacy coins or privacy shit points, depends how you want to look at them. And they will be adding additional functionality 
for privacy coins besides uh, Monero. So this is... Uh, I, 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 I love how they say it's Scamerai wallet. <laughs> oh, wait, this isn't them. This is... Uh, <laughs> wait, this is, is this not official? Account. No, it's not. It, it was a troll account. Never mind. <laughs> I just opened the tweet. This is not the real one. Uh, this is a troll one. Also, yeah, they're, not right. actually, they're not actually adding a like, I bet you Giacomo created this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they have the same PGP key? So this is not a real thing. Okay, no, I just opened this for the first time. Anyway, this is why we should look to read the stories before we cover them. Uh, we'll cover this next time. Uh, I can talk to them and discuss it. Yeah, go ahead. I want to say one thing about it, because that's been years to think about Monero. Um, because uh, there's a moral reason to have that. It's not... Uh, my, my eventual conclusion was if you trade any feature for decentralization, it, it's not worth it. And Monero is not decentralized. So I don't care what its feature is, even if it's the best feature in the world, privacy by design, it won't last if it's centralized and it's centralized. So that's why Bitcoin is the only game in town because it's decentralized. I can't believe how many years it took me to figure that out, but that's basically why Monero is not worth it. And it's why when I meet the Monero bros and I go, oh, uh, you're not an F head. You're not a B cashier. Fair enough. You're not telling me Craig Wright is, you know, great. And Peter Todd works for the CIA. Like, finally, you know, you're, you've got some morals, but you're still wrong. And that's, uh, that's basically the simplest explanation of why, I think. All right. We should save that for next time because uh -huh. it's a long discussion. Yeah, and we will. All right. Jimmy, sign us out. All right, uh, I have three books. Programming Bitcoin is for developers that want to learn about Bitcoin, if you are a developer and don't know much about how Bitcoin programming works, that is the book for you, step-by-step. Step. It takes you from elliptic curve cryptography to Bitcoin network programming. Uh, the other two books I have are The Little Bitcoin Book and Thank God for Bitcoin. Both books are meant for beginners. Uh, the Thank God for Bitcoin is more for Christians and uh, The Little Bitcoin Book is more for uh, people that don't know but are curious. Um, I have Programming Bitcoin, uh, 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 the Programming Blockchain Seminar coming up in Ensenada, Mexico. In, on August 10th and 11th, if you want to learn directly from me over two days, um, uh, how to program Bitcoin, uh, apply at that link. Um, yeah, that's about it for me. All right. Uh, I am going to cover price guys real, real quick. Uh, but for now, we're going to give uh, Bitcoin Mechanic a little plug. He's got his own YouTube channel. Uh, go ahead and check that out, guys. And you can find him on Twitter as Grass Fed Bitcoin. Yeah. Um, please give me a follow. Please uh, sub to the YouTube channel, even if you don't really care about it. Uh, I don't make that many videos at the moment because I'm not motivated to. If I get a thousand subs and I can uh, do the thing where you can actually make money using your YouTube channel, that will definitely help motivate me. I haven't had much time to work on it lately. Um, I think uh, I'll be taking a job at Start9 Labs. They're the people that make uh, the Embassy OS, which is one of these node projects on a Raspberry Pi. Uh, but it's um, a lot. It's a paid product. Uh, you can compile it from source yourself, and they will help you do that if they want, just because they're in it for the ideology, not the money. But uh, I'm really impressed with this project. I'm, I'm excited to start working there if I end up working there. And I definitely encourage people to check it out. It, it goes beyond Bitcoin with just making other things self-sovereign. So it's not just money. You can host your own chat. You can host your own Mastodon instance. You can host your own uh, file server, Tor websites, everything. So it's, it's not a shitcoin escapade. It's just Bitcoin is one part of the whole digital self-sovereign thing. And yeah. it makes it you know, doable. Start9 was a sponsor of last year's or the last unconfiscatable conference we had. I really should, you know, get back in touch with them and maybe get like some kind of an affiliate link for my affiliate page, which I don't really even promote anymore. They still don't, they still don't have an affiliate set up. Oh, they they're okay. they're going to be, they'll That's be getting fine. that together in the next few weeks. They're doing a big release of uh, 0 0.3, which is oh, finally... Okay, yeah. Yeah. Since, you're, since you're going to be over there, like the moment that's available, I would love to get this up with one. <laughs> yeah, cool. But uh, but yeah, no, Start9, we are supporters of Start9, and that's why they were on the short list of potential sponsors. All right, uh, we're going to glance at the price of Bitcoin. Jimmy, if you have to go, uh, we are going to go and say goodbye uh, to you. Enjoy family time. 
and um thanks yeah the yeah. the lenda s this song is done bye guys all right bye this jimmy. One's jimmy peace um i'm not sure how embly could have scammed anyone because they don't hold any of your money but reach out to them and uh i'm sure they will fix it i uh, i will uh, uh maybe try to also hit up joe saz as well he's involved with embly but um uh, that is still a viable company they're just not operating in certain parts of the world due to regulation um okay um so let's look at price um, I have been very cautious on the daily chart of Bitcoin, mostly because of the upcoming rise uh, into the declining moving average. So I was not on the bandwagon that we are ready to break out. Uh, so I've been warning people about that, that I was going to stay cautious. Uh, and I still think that a capitulation low later this month is very, very possible. Uh, right now, we are dropping back below $34,000, which is a bit of a problem. The weekly chart does not look anything uh, fancy to be impressed with. Uh, so I will continue to be very, very cautious. I am happy to buy the dip if the price of Bitcoin falls and makes a new low. The next time Bitcoin makes a new low, uh, below $28,800. And this particular dip was very, very quick. Very quick, hard to catch. The next one could be harder to catch at the low, but it should be easier to catch it below 28000 I have not ruled this out. I am putting greater than a 50% chance that the $30,000 area would get broken once again. Uh, if you objectively look at this chart, there's absolutely, I don't see anything bullish in this chart. I know people keep talking about the Wyckoff distribution, but if we fall below $31,000 one more time, that, that entire Wyckoff distribution is nullified. And that is why I'm not a huge fan of these patterns that take forever to identify. Uh, they only seem to make sense to me uh, in hindsight and not in real time. Uh, even though in real time, people have been timing it well up to this point. But we now have to break out. And I was always skeptical that this break of the 53 moving average would occur. And it doesn't look like it's going to happen right now. Maybe on the next shot. So this is still my projection. Uh, maybe not as low as 23,000. But some kind of a capitulation uh, would be nice. And that is my buy the dip situation. Uh, that is pretty much it on the price. Here's the one hour chart. Uh, the one hour chart certainly has downside. Look at this break. As you guys know, I love the break of a uh, consolidated high as we have right here. Just like I like the break of the consolidated low. This is also, this was a red star candle that is breaking the support line of the MRI that is breaking below the prior support area. So obviously this is a, a short trade here and it was preceded buy an MRI buy with a textbook one to four candle correction followed by more downside. So I will continue to keep an eye on that. Obviously, GBTC is taking a break. Once GBTC has a positive GBTC premium, you will see the price of Bitcoin rise quickly because now there will be more people interested in buying into the GBTC trust if there is no ETF. And, um, uh, and because of that, uh, GBTC will once again start taking Bitcoin out of the market. Uh, Bitcoin dominance isn't really doing anything. Gold is still consolidating near the lows. Uh, I still think gold has bottom for the year. Uh, oil, I continue to be bullish on oil here as it's consolidating near the top. S&P 500, I remain bullish on in the S&P 500 as well. Uh, that is it for me. If you're interested in learning trading, check out the free learn trading section. Uh, we are still looking for a potential venue in Dubai for understanding Bitcoin in October. And if we can find a venue, we will update the website to allow people to register. On Confiscatable, we'll be coming back to Las Vegas uh, in March of next year. More update on that later this summer. And we will be in Dubai for the financial summit 
uh, well, more like Ras al Khaima, which is a region just north of Dubai, but you do have to fly into the Dubai airport uh, to get there. So, Dubai. Um, all right, guys, everyone knows Dubai. Not many people know Ras al Khaima. All right, guys, uh, thank you all so much for watching. I will see you all on the next one. Uh, Lex, you're still with us, man. Any closing thoughts? No, that was a great show, man. I'm looking forward to doing the Monero, the privacy coin debunk, uh, or at least a fair, let's give them a fair analysis. Yeah, you know, back in the day, I used to have the show called Crypto Scam, and I did a Crypto Scam episode about Dash with, you know, the leader of Monero being Fluffy Pony. Uh -huh. So, you know, I haven't had a Crypto Scam episode in a long time. I think if Crypto Scam returns, Monero would be a good show. Uh, if you want to just do a one hour talk about why Monero belongs in the crypto scam series. Yeah, I'd love to do that, man. Uh, we could do it as a panel or we can just do it with us two. Uh, either way, it would be a, it'd be an exciting show to do. Like yeah, there are these guys nice. like uh, Fluffy Pony and Charlie Lee. Uh, I think it's Charlie Lee. No, Bobby Lee's the brother, right? Charlie Lee is like, Charlie Lee is the Litecoin guy and former uh, employee of Coinbase. And uh, Bobby Lee is the former BTC China exchange and now the ballet one. Yeah, some shitcoiners are smart enough not to be antagonistic towards Bitcoin like Vitalik is. So uh, that gives people that lets people have more leeway with them. Uh, but I still consider Litecoin a joke. And uh, I, I respect what Monero tries to do, but it, it's very important that people don't view it outside of people people just have the wrong impression about what things like monero are and i think it'd be good to clear that up i think monero is actually like one of the hugest issues uh to explain to people because everything else is much easier to dismiss uh like even ethereum is an easy scam to explain in comparison it's not easy but it's still not something people should buy and invest it's certainly not a store of value um and it needs to be like that needs to be put out there that information well, uh, so if you are still with us and watching right now, check out the old Crypto Scam series. There is a Crypto Scam playlist on my YouTube channel. There is an episode for Litecoin. There is three episodes for Ethereum. And there is an episode for Dash, which was the privacy uh, coin. Uh, so combining all three of those will give you an idea of what we will say when we do our Crypto Scam uh, Monero. Yeah, and it's uh, got Peter Todd. Episode. You got Peter Todd to do one of them, right? Yeah, that was Ripple. Yeah. Yeah. You're well, not I mean, Ripple. That was a great episode. I remember watching it. It's definitely worth watching. Even though Ripple basically got burnt to the ground, right? About <laughs> eight months ago. It's still good to watch. And Peter Todd's insights are always incredible. Yeah. So if you just go to my the homepage of Tone Base YouTube channel, that is not actually it. Uh, thank God I don't watch crazy things on YouTube. Otherwise, that would have been interesting. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you watched Awaken with JP. What's his name? That guy. I do. It's great. It's yeah, awesome. Joyce knows I love Awaken him. with JP. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, I stopped watching it for a while, but I just saw his latest episode about the uh, uh, the female male uh, weightlifter out of New Zealand in the female division, which was a really funny episode. Uh, yeah, the Crypto Scam series is right here, uh, so you can go ahead and find all the old Crypto Scam episodes. Uh, the last one was about um, Adam Back being Satoshi, the crypto scam episode, uh, debunking some silly uh, YouTuber. Anyway, so you can check these out. Here is the entire crypto scam podcast series. All right. All right, guys. Thank you all so much for watching, and I will 